In one of my earlier YouTube videos, uh, we talked about the fundamentals of SDN, Software Defined Networking. And in this video, we want to compare a couple of SDN controllers offered by Cisco, the APIC and the APIC EM. Before we get into those specific controllers, though, just a quick review about what is SDN, why do we want it? Well, it goes back to traditional network management, where every device, like a router or a switch, has its own management plane, control plane, data plane, and we manage the devices individually. We go and we connect into the router, we connect into the switch, and we give commands via the CLI to perform configuration on those devices. Now, certainly there have been some GUI interfaces to help us out along the way, like a Cisco Configuration Professional, but even with a solution like that, we're still managing a device one at a time. And in today's environment, we've got all sorts of very dynamic demands. We might need to spin up a virtual machine because we're anticipating a big load coming into a data center. And we might need to do some load balancing across different Cisco Nexus switches in the data center to accommodate that extra load. We might need to set some quality of service policies. And then we might need to go back to the way things were before after this big flood of traffic comes in. We might need to move a virtual machine from one data center to another data center. There are all sorts of dynamic demands, and it can take a long time to have to go administer all these things individually on a device-by-device -device basis. That's where SDN can help us out. We said that the individual devices had a management plane. The management plane is taking care of how we connect to and interact with the device. This is where things like Secure Shell or, or Telnet or SNMP might be running. The control plane is taking care of things like routing protocols on a router or spanning tree protocol on a switch. Here we have the protocols and the rules that can populate forwarding tables on a router or MAC address to port mappings on a switch. And then the data plane is concerned with getting uh, packets or frames in one interface and out another interface. We might be looking up a destination network in a routing table on a router. We might be looking up a destination MAC address in a CAM table on a switch. Those types of things happen at the data plane. And with SDN, what we can do is take the control plane from these different devices and we can have those control planes all go live inside of the SDN controller. And the SDN controller can run the routing protocols or the spanning tree protocol. It can administer all that stuff and it can push instructions down to the devices. Now this way of doing SDN is called a stateful approach. This is where the controller is doing the heavy lifting of doing things like reconfiguring the fabric, translating policies into specific commands to send out to these devices. And the way the SDN controller communicates down to these devices is through a southbound interface or a southbound API, an application programming interface. And one of the most popular types of SDN controllers out there today is called Open Daylight. And there's a protocol used by Open Daylight called Open Flow. So we might be using Open Flow as our southbound application programming interface between the SDN controller and our devices like routers and switches. And we say it's southbound because when we draw this out, typically we draw the devices below the controller. So if you were looking at a, at a compass, south would be at the bottom. So these are below the controller, they're south of the controller. Now, north of the controller, that's where we have applications. And applications can communicate to the controller through, of course, northbound interfaces. For example, we could have REST APIs, representational state transfer APIs. Now, here's what that means. That means that we could have an application such as a, a Python program that maybe we write or we have somebody else write for us. We could have a Python program as an example send HTTP commands to the SDN controller to tell it to do certain things. We could use a command like get or post, regular HTTP or HTTPS commands. We could use those commands to send commands to the SDN controller, but we don't have to write applications necessarily to use SDN. We can have uh, some nice GUI interfaces that we purchase that can send commands to the SDN controller. And this is a common way of looking at SDN. However, Cisco takes a bit of a different approach with their controllers. With the Cisco controllers that we're going to be discussing, the APIC, the Cisco Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, and the APIC-EM, where EM stands for Enterprise Module, the APIC and the APIC-EM, they have the control plane back down in the devices. And Cisco argues that this is a better solution 
as compared to having the control plane live in the SDN controller. Here, the controller is a stateless controller. It pushes policies down to the devices, and it's the device's responsibility to take those policies and convert those into corresponding commands. The controller doesn't have to know the state of all the devices at any one time. In fact, Cisco says you can actually lose your controller. It could go down and your network would keep running. Your control plane doesn't live there. It pushes the policies down to the devices, but it's not in charge of the second by second operation of the devices. Now, this is the APIC. We typically see it in data centers. There's another controller that Cisco has, the APIC EM, the APIC Enterprise Module. And we typically see this more in a uh, campus LAN or maybe a remote office or a router going out to the WAN. And one of the cool things about the APIC EM is it can interact with our traditional devices. For example, here in my studio, I've got four 2900 series routers. Well, they don't speak OpenFlow or Cisco OpFlex, which is similar to OpenFlow, but it's a protocol that Cisco created, which is supported by the APIC, by the way. But these traditional devices, my Cisco Catalyst switches, these ISR2 routers, they don't speak those SDN languages, but we can communicate with them using Telnet or Secure Shell or SNMP, traditional ways of communicating on the management plane with these devices. That's what the APIC EM can do. It can send commands using those types of connections. And we can still communicate with the APIC EM, or the APIC for that matter, using those REST, or some people say RESTful APIs, where we're sending HTTP and HTTPS commands to the controller to say, do this, give me this information. And in this video, we want to take a look at some of the characteristics of both the APIC and the APIC EM. Let's begin with the APIC. We said that the APIC lives in a data center environment. Here's a common topology we see in a data center. It's called a leaf and spine topology. We've got N switches that our nodes connect into, like our compute resources, our servers in Iraq, for example. They connect into leaf switches, and the leaf switches are interconnected by spine switches. And as a result, this leaf and spine topology, this interconnection of switches, it can logically look as and be administered as a single switch. Think of the switches on the spine as being a backplane to a modular switch. And notice that each of the leaf switches has a direct connection to every spine switch. We can get from any leaf switch to another leaf switch by only going through a single spine switch. So this is logically kind of like one big switch that we have there in the data center. And if we have leaf and spine switches such as Cisco Nexus 7000 or Nexus 9000 series switches, we can have our APIC communicate with these switches. In fact, the Cisco Nexus 9000 series switch, it actually has an ACI mode. ACI, that stands for Application Centric Infrastructure. That's a way that Cisco does SDN in the data center. Specifically, ACI is going to use application policy profiles to automatically configure the infrastructure, in other words, all the devices in the infrastructure, to support a specific application needs. And this can be done securely. Cisco calls it multi-tenancy support, where we can have different customers using the same stack of switches in the same rack, but logically be separated where their traffic does not overlap at any point. ACI allows us to monitor the health of an application. Maybe one of those nodes is experiencing congestion, and therefore the application is suffering on one of the nodes. Well, ACI can detect that, and it can dynamically move that application to another virtual machine in a different rack, or maybe even in a different data center. These types of things can be controlled by using the APIC to oversee everything. Now, notice that I have three APICs on the screen. Cisco recommends that we never have fewer than three, and sometimes we want many more than this. We never want to have fewer than three APICs. We put those in a cluster. We typically dual attach those to our leaf switches for some redundancy. And these APIC SDN controllers, they can be used to monitor and manage these devices in the data center. Let's look at some specific characteristics of the APIC. Now, we've already said that the APIC is typically used in data centers as compared to the LAN or on a WAN route or something like that. And it does have several different applications that we can use. For example, there's a policy manager, and the policy manager contains a collection of, of policies and rules that can be applied to existing endpoints or endpoints that we haven't yet created, but we're going to, and when we do, we'll say, let's apply this policy. It also has a topology manager that maintains information about the topology and the inventory 
the exact device is in the topology. There's an observer application that performs monitoring of the ACI components. There's a boot director that's in charge of updating the firmware and booting different spine and leaf switches. There's the appliance director. Remember that Cisco recommends that we have at least three APICs in a cluster. Well, the appliance director is in charge of setting up and controlling that cluster. There's also a virtual machine manager or a VMM application. This acts as an intermediary between a hypervisor management system, for example, VMware vCenter, and a platform such as uh, OpenStack. There's an event manager, and the event manager stores all the events, all the faults that are coming from the fabric nodes and from the APICs. And there's also an appliance element. And this application runs on the individual APIC controllers. And it manages an individual controller as opposed to a cluster of controllers. And there can certainly be more applications, but these are typical applications that we find on an APIC. And we typically find the APIC in a data center. And the purpose of this video is not to teach you how to operate and configure an APIC, but I do want you to see it. I want you to get a feel for what the interface looks like. So let's go out to a live interface right now and check out the APIC. Here we're looking at an APIC dashboard, the system dashboard, and it's warning us that the cluster contains less than three in-service controllers. Remember the recommendation from Cisco is that we have a cluster of at least three controllers. And here in this lab environment, we don't have that. We could go in and look at information. For example, let's look at the, at the fabric. I could say, show me the information about pod one. I could uh, take a look at my leaf one switch. Let's take a look at the interfaces. I could look at the physical interfaces, and I could drill into one of the physical interfaces and uh, maybe see the, the operational state of that interface. We see some traffic patterns that have been seen on that interface. We can have different apps installed. Let's take a look at this one. It's going to give us some bandwidth usage information. It's kind of a, an attractive one I wanted to show you. Yeah, we can see that we've got these different nodes on specific pods, on specific ports, and we see their traffic patterns. And when we change something or we set something up in this interface, we're sending out a REST message to the controller in the background to say, do this or do that. And one thing that's kind of cool about this is I can go under admin and say, show API inspector. And it's a little bit small on the screen, but what you can do is see the actual commands that are being sent to the controller. Like here's an HTTPS command where we're doing a query. This is a, a get command. We could make a change though, and there would be a, a post command here. Here's a post command. What we could do is actually copy these commands and use these commands inside of our applications that we're writing. Maybe we're writing a Python script. We can actually get some of the commands from that interface. That's just one of the many, many features of the APIC. I just think that's really cool, and I wanted to show that one to you. Now, let's consider some of these specifics of the APIC EM controller. We said that the APIC controller was typically used in a data center environment, but the APIC EM, it's used more in a campus or a branch office or maybe a router connecting out to the wide area network. Now, in a campus, it's common to have a three-tier architecture like we see here, where we have an access layer, a distribution layer, and we have a core layer. The access layer connects out to the end devices, I often refer to these as wiring closet switches. These connect out to the printers, to the, to the PCs, to the hardwired devices. Maybe they connect out to wireless access points too, but these are the switches typically that connect out to the end devices. Now, within a building, if we have lots of buildings on a campus, we might have a distribution layer within a building where each of the access layer switches dual connects back to the distribution layer switches. And then to get from one building to another building, we can go through the core layer switches. And the core layer is concerned with getting traffic as fast as possible between one building distribution layer switch and another building distribution layer switch. But in some environments, this is overkill. We don't need three tiers oftentimes in our campus or in our remote offices. So another topology that's really catching on these days is called a collapsed core topology. And it works like this. 
we combine the core and the distribution layers, and we have a collapsed core layer. So now the access layer switches, they just connect into this collapsed core, and this is a lot more efficient in terms of cost. We don't have to buy as many switches because we might not need them. Maybe the network just isn't big enough to need that much. But I wanted to show you these different topologies to contrast what we would see in a campus or a branch office with what we see in a data center, where we typically have a, a leaf and spine topology. But in these types of environments, we might be using an APIC EM because an APIC EM can speak traditional southbound APIs. And by that, I mean it can use Telnet. It can use Secure Shell. It can use SNMP to communicate with our traditional Cisco routers and switches. Now, let's take a look at just a few of the characteristics of the APIC EM. We said that the APIC, its purpose in life is uh, usually in the data center. With the APIC EM, it's typically used for a campus, a branch, or a WAN connection. It does have some applications of its own. I'll take you out and give you a, a sneak peek at those in a moment. For example, there's a way to visualize the network topology. It can go out and using SNMP and CDP, the Cisco Discovery Protocol, it can dynamically learn your topology and give you a map of it. It can help you set up a Cisco Intelligent WAN or an iWAN connection. And one of the things I love about the APIC EM that I've maybe used more than any other thing is its ability to do a path trace. You can play a what if game. You can say, what if I tried to send this type of traffic for maybe this router over to this other router? Here's the source and destination IP addresses. What would happen? Would it get there? Maybe there's an access control list in the middle that blocks it. If there is, it will visually show us where that ACL lives. And if there are multiple paths to get from point A to point B, it will show us which path it's going to take. And just like we went out and took a quick look at the APIC interface, let's do the same thing now for the APIC EM. Here we're taking a look at the APIC EM interface. This is the, the dashboard, and we can see we've got 14 devices that the APIC EM knows about. But here are some of those applications I was talking about. Here we can go into the discovery application, and we can say that we want to start searching from a specific IP address, and we can go in and we can configure passwords or SNMP community strings, maybe, if that's what we're using. And we can discover a topology. We can uh, look at our device inventory to see information about the devices in our topology right now. We can take a look at specific host information. We can look at this topology view that we talked about. And here's the topology we're working with right now. We can also use this to set up an iWAN connection. I don't have one set up right now, but you can see the interface anyway. And here's probably my favorite feature, the path trace feature. We can say, if I want to start a new path trace, I want to go from this source to this destination. There's lots of options I can fill in here. And I can say, consider access control lists as you do that trace. And there are some other things that APIC EM can do. Cisco is always updating it and coming out with new versions. But I wanted to give you a quick glimpse of what the APIC EM interface looks like. And that's a comparison between two different SDN controllers that Cisco offers us, both of which are somewhat of a paradigm shift from the industry standard SDN controller, where we think of the control plane living in the controller. That's called a stateful controller. Now, Cisco, the APIC, and the APIC EM, they leave the control planes in the devices themselves, and that would be a stateless controller. And Cisco says we shouldn't try it, but uh, technically we could have the network continue to run if we turned off our controller. And we said that the APIC, typically found in the data center, APIC EM, typically found in our campus, in our remote offices, or maybe we're setting up some sort of an IWAN connection.